Hello, my name is Mindy Spies. I'm a research animal scientist at the USDA Meat Animal Research Center in Clay Center, Nebraska. Today, I'm going to talk to you about a project that we've been working on measuring emissions of ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, and greenhouse gases following the application of aluminum sulfate or alum to beef feedlot surfaces. When we think about concentrated animal feeding op operations or CAFOs, they're intensely managed production systems to improve efficiency and allow for better care of the animals. However, this concentration of the animals can also have a negative impact on the environment. Cattle feedlot pen surfaces are especially problematic because the cattle manure is directly exposed to environmental elements such as rain, snow, sun, and wind, as opposed to, for example, a confined swine operation. Feedlot surface material is also unlike any other agricultural soil because it consists of a mixture of soil and manure. Chemical, physical, and biological reactions occur on the feedlot surface that result in the release of a variety of compounds. Some reactions occur independently of one another, others are correlated, which makes it difficult to always figure out exactly what's going on on the feedlot surface. Typical airborne pollutants from CAFOs are comprised of particulate matter, biological materials, and one way to kind of break down or group these pollutants is to consider them in some general classes. For example, the global warming gases or greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. There's also the regulated gases like ammonia or hydrogen sulfide is sometimes regulated at the property line. And then there's just other general odorous compounds like the volatile fatty acids. While odor often gets the attention of cattle producers and those living nearby feedlots, greenhouse gases are becoming an increasingly important air emission. According to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, 9% of total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions are from agriculture. Enteric methane emissions from ruminant animals represent about 30% of these emissions, but manure management also contributes 14%, primarily through the emissions of methane and nitrous oxide. Since 1990, greenhouse gas emissions from the agricultural sector have increased about 9%. If we look at individual contributions of greenhouse gases, we see that carbon dioxide accounts for 76% of the total greenhouse gas emissions. Methane accounts for 16%, although it has a higher global warming potential than carbon dioxide. Nitrous oxide only accounts for about 6% of the total emissions, but it has a global warming potential of 296 times the carbon dioxide equivalent on a 100 year scale. There's a lot of interest in the agriculture industry to reduce or eliminate greenhouse gases. In October 2020, the Innovative Center for the U.S. Dairy unveiled the Net Zero Initiative, which is an industry-wide effort to help U.S. dairy farmers of all sizes implement new technologies and adopt economically viable practices to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. This was followed closely by the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. On, in August of 2021, the NCBA announced a commitment to environmental, economic, and social sustainability by announcing that U.S. cattle production would be climate neutral or carbon neutral by 2040. With these big initiatives, all technologies that affect odor and gas emissions also need to consider the impact of greenhouse gas. Hydrogen sulfide is one sulfur compound that can be regulated at the property level. It's naturally occurring, it's colorless, and has a characteristic rotten egg smell. The most common sources of hydrogen sulfide are oil and natural gas extractions. But it can also be formed during bacterial decomposition of human and animal waste. Now, not only can this particular gas be odorous, it can also have health effects on both animals and humans. At concentrations as low as 1 or 10 parts per million, we can begin to see some irritations, headache, nausea. And at levels as high as 800 parts per million, there can be complete nervous system failure or sudden death. Ammonia is another odorous gas that is regulated at the property level of many, many CAFOs. Ammonia can contribute also to health issues in humans and animals. It contributes to acidity in the environment, algae in lakes, and also forms small particles in the air. According to the USDA Air Quality Task Force, of the 3.6 million tons of ammonia that are emitted, 60 to 85% of the U.S. ammonia emissions are from agricultural sources, with livestock waste being the biggest contributor to that. Several strategies have been investigated to reduce ammonia, sulfides, and other emissions from beef feedlot facilities, including the use of several pen surface amendments. Urease is an enzyme that converts urea to ammonia. When this reaction is inhibited through urease inhibitors, ammonia emissions are reduced. When urease inhibitors were applied, ammonia emissions were reduced by 35% compared to untreated feedlot surface material. 
Other studies found that when a urease inhibitor was combined with the plant essential oil thiamol, it retained significant, there was significantly more urea that was retained in the feedlot surface material, which indicated less ammonia loss when the two products were used in combination. Further studies examined other things such as corn oil, um, alum, and potassium zeolite as surface amendments on lab scale feedlot surfaces. The addition of zeolite and fat decreased ammonia losses by 51 to 86 percent in some cases. Pine based bedding materials have been demonstrated to reduce ammonia and greenhouse gas emissions compared to other crop based bedding materials as well. The one that we were particularly interested in looking at was alum. The poultry industry has been successfully using aluminum sulfate or alum to lower ammonia emissions for the past decade. Alum works by inhibiting the volatilization of nitrogen as ammonia. Ammonia volatilization from the feedlot surface depends on several variables, including pH, temperature, and moisture content. When the pH is above 8, a large percentage of inorganic nitrogen is in the ammonia form and can be easily volatilized. Alum works by reducing the pH, which mineralizes the nitrogen to the ammonium form and inhibits volatilization. We did some preliminary research in our lab using some feedlot surface material and alum in a lab scale study and found that we were successfully able to decrease ammonia volatilization from the feedlot surface material. However, we wanted to see what would happen when we took it out to the actual feedlot where it would be exposed to the elements as well as constant addition of urine and feces from the cattle. So the objective of this study was to investigate the effects of adding alum to the beef feedlot surface on air emissions, specifically ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, and the greenhouse gases. To conduct this experiment, we had eight pens of cattle, feedlot cattle. We had four pens that contained alum and four that did not contain alum. The amount of alum that was added was based on the mass of the feedlot surface material for a depth of five centimeters, using the estimated density of the feedlot surface material in Nebraska, which is about 1.5 grams per cubic centimeter. We surface applied the alum to the six liters directly behind the bunk apron and allowed the cattle to mix in the alum with the feedlot surface material. We took samples on day negative one, which was the day prior to the alum application, day zero, which was when we applied the alum, followed by day five, seven, 12, 14, 19, 21, and 26. We collected six representative grab samples from each of the the pens, the feedlot surface area in that six meter area behind the bunk. The samples were combined by pen, and then we took three replicates out per pen. We measured the gases in an environmental chamber at an ambient temperature of 25 degrees C and 50% relative humidity. We measured flux measurements for 15 minutes, and again, we measured ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, methane, carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide. Each day when we collected a sample, we also took the pH, and the addition of 10% alum on a mass basis successfully lowered the pH of the treated area from 8.3 to 4.7 on day zero. Alum treated pens has a significantly lower pH for 21 of the 26 days of the study. Although we had a fair bit of variability in our ammonia emissions, and there was a little anomaly on day seven that we really can't explain, in general, we see significantly lower ammonia emissions from the feedlot surface material that had been treated with 10% alum compared to the feedlot surface material that was not treated for up to 15 days. And this is consistent with our previous lab studies that we had conducted that indicated we could successfully lower ammonia emissions for 14 to 21 days following alum application. Hydrogen sulfide was variable throughout the study with peaks at day zero, seven, and then again at day 19 until the end of the study. The higher Hydrogen sulfide emission is consistent with our previous lab scale study. And we feel that this is because the sulfur was added to the surface through the addition of aluminum sulfate and it was being converted to hydrogen sulfide on the surface. With the exception of the day zero sampling, carbon dioxide was consistently and significantly lower from feedlot surface material collected from the pens with 10% alum compared to the pens that did not receive an alum application. And this was likely due to the drop in pH, which created an environment that was not conducive to bacterial activity. Overall, methane was quite low from all feedlot surface material. However, and surprisingly, methane was higher from feedlot surface material collected from pens treated with 10% alum compared to pens that were not treated. The lower pH from the alum should have prohibited the methanogenesis. So we're not sure if the alum did not penetrate deeply into the soil and maybe the anaerobic areas of the feedlot surface that were producing the methane were deep enough below the surface they weren't affected by the drop in pH. Not exactly sure what's going on with that particular 
gas. As with methane emissions, nitrous oxide was quite low for the feedlot surface material from both treatments, with no significant differences between the feedlot surface material treated with alum and the feedlot surface that did not receive an alum treatment. So in conclusion, ammonia and carbon dioxide were lower when 10% alum was applied to the feedlot surface. Overall, greenhouse gases were quite low from the pens regardless of alum treatment, but methane was higher from pens that had 10% alum applied compared to pens that did not receive an alum treatment. Hydrogen sulfide was higher from feedlot surface material collected from pens that had the 10% alum application, which does create some concerns for the use of alum to mitigate gas emissions from beef feedlots. Because of the limited effectiveness of alum in reducing ammonia, it really didn't reduce it past 15 days. If we couple this with increased hydrogen sulfide and methane emissions, aluminum sulfite does not appear to be a good feedlot surface amendment to use for beef open lot feedlots. Just as some final thoughts, cost is always a concern when we're talking about any kind of a feedlot mitigation. When alum is applied at a 10% rate, it would cost about 75 cents per square foot to treat a pen. So we do have previous research that's demonstrated a lot of spatial variability in feedlot pens. And so our next thought is, can we identify locations that contribute the most to particularly ammonia emissions, but other gas emissions, and just apply amendments to those areas only and see if we have the same or similar reduction in gases as if we treated an entire pen just to try to save some cost. Alum doesn't seem to reduce ammonia for a long period of time on the feedlot surface, and that could be partly because of environmental effects such as exposure to, to rain and sun and wind, and of course the additional application of urine and feces from the cattle. So we're wondering if we can apply an initial dose of 10% and then add smaller increments on a weekly or bi-monthly basis to maintain an adequate concentration that would inhibit ammonia volatilization or other gases. And this would be with alum or any other feedlot surface amendment. However, our biggest concern with aluminum sulfate is addition of the sulfide to the feedlot surface. And we saw this in the lab and when we brought it out onto the actual feedlot surface that we did have the addition of or increase in hydrogen sulfide emissions. So future studies from our lab are going to evaluate aluminum chloride as a potential feedlot surface amendment. And that concludes my presentation. My contact information is on the slide there if you should need to get a hold of me. Otherwise, I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have about this research project. Thank you. Mindy, did you notice any uh, changes either measured or observed in the soil moisture or, or properties? Uh, okay, so we did um, we did measure that in our lab scale study, and actually, the um, when the alum was present, it seemed to hold in more moisture. I don't I I don't uh, have the data in front of me for when we did it on the feedlot surface itself, but um, it did seem to retain more moisture. Is that consistent with what you have thought, Rick, or not, or? Yeah, my my thought is if it retains the moisture, it's behaving more like a, closer to a liquid, and uh, that would be more exp help explain the more methane. Yeah, and that that's a that's a good point because we're thinking it seems more like a an anaerobic system with that that methane in there. So, hi Mindy, um, my question is on the instruments that you use to measure specifically ammonia and also the greenhouse gases, methane and nitrous oxide. Could you describe that a little bit? How you did that? Yeah, so um, so we have uh, we have thermal scientific uh, instruments for um, all of our our gas measurements, and we also have a, a ANOVA. We have it set up so we have uh, flux chambers, like small wind tunnels, I guess. We have it uh, set up on a so so that we we flush in um, fresh air or uh, zero air, and then we we pull the samples out. Um, through the wind tunnel and we sample for 15 minutes and we allow it to stabilize for the first seven minutes and then we start taking our measurements actually uh, and and so it has a little actuator that switches between so it measures one for 15 minutes and then it goes to the next one the next one to the next one does that answer your question kind of or yes thank you Mindy okay um, mm -hmm. we, we have time for maybe one or more questions 